Ezekiel chapter 37 and verse one. The Lord took hold of me and I was carried away by the Spirit of the Lord to a valley filled with bones. He led me all around, all around among the bones that covered the valley floor. They were scattered everywhere across the ground and were completely dried out. Then he asked me, son of man, can these bones become living people again? O sovereign Lord, I replied, you alone know the answer to that. Then he said to me, speak a prophetic message to these bones and say, dry bones, listen to the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says. Look, I am going to put breath into you and I will make you live again. I will put flesh and muscles on you and will cover you with skin. I will put breath into you and you will know that I am the Lord. So I spoke this message just as he told me. Suddenly, as I spoke, as I spoke, there was a rattling noise all across the valley. The bones of each body came together and attached themselves as complete skeletons. Then as I watched, muscles and flesh formed over the bones, then skin formed to cover their bodies, but they still had no breath in them. Then he said to me, speak a prophetic message to the winds, son of man, and say, and speak a prophetic message and say, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Come, O breath, from these four winds. Breathe into these dead bodies that they may live again. So I spoke the message as He commanded me and the breath came into their bones and they all came to life and stood on their feet a great army. Then He said to me, Son of man, these bones represent the people of Israel. They are saying, they are saying, we have become old, dry bones, all hope is gone, our nation has finished. Therefore, prophesy to them and say, this is what the sovereign Lord says, O my people, I will cause your graves of exile, I will open your graves of exile and cause you to rise again. Then I will bring you back to the land of Israel. When this happens, O my people, you will know that I am the Lord and I will put my spirit in you and you will live again and return to your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and that I have done what I said. Yes, the Lord has spoken. At the beginning of last year, 2017, my daughter Lara began high school. Single worst moment of my life. As a parent, you need to understand every teenager here that we would like you to get old enough that we no longer have to feed you, change your nappy, clean up after you. We no longer want, we don't want you to get through the stage where you keep us awake at night, but we would like for you to stay somewhere between the ages of maybe four and 12 for the rest of your life where you just love us and wanna be with us all the time. When my daughter Lara finally got to the age where she started high school, I'm like, this has happened way too fast. I remember sending her off to school on the first day, Jillian was fine with it, and I, I'm like a basket case. I'm worried about people, things, life, high school, all the things I did. I'm like thinking, this is not a good idea. She goes off to high school, it's the worst thing in my life. But there was one little silver lining and the silver lining was that it takes half an hour to get from where we live to my daughter's school and I get to drive her every day. Quality time with my princess, I love it. We get in the car and we're driving and now it's a new thing too because she's a teenager. So suddenly she's become a night person not at all functional in the morning. So I had to create a way that we could interact in this car drive. So Hudson, I came up with a game. It's called Bible Trivia. I think you'd like this game. We drive to school every day and we play a game called Bible Trivia. We spent the whole year doing it. Every day we get in the car. Lara, would you like to play Bible Trivia? Yes, and then we play it. We've gone all through the Bible. I think she knows more about the Bible than most of her life group leaders or youth leaders do. In term four, I ran out of content. I thought, what are we gonna do? We've done all the sons of Israel. We've got, you know, we've we've gone through all the miracles. We've done all this stuff. I'm like, what are we gonna do? So I decided in term four, we were gonna do Old Testament overview. It's a true story. So we began at the beginning of term four and I taught my daughter an overview of the Old Testament. Would you like it in 30 seconds? Would you like it, Andy? You would like it? This is an overview of the Old Testament. Firstly, the thing you need to know about the Old Testament is that there are 39 books in the Old Testament. It is made up of three sections. The first 17 are historic. The next five 
are poetic. The remaining 17 are prophetic. 17 historic, five poetic, and then 17 prophetic. The first five books of the Old Testament are recorded before Israel entered the promised land, Canaan or Israel. They were written by Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the Pentateuch, five books. Then we have the next 12 books of the Old Testament are also historic in nature. The first nine of those were written while Israel was in the promised land. But because of their sin, eventually the Babylonians took them from Israel into exile or into captivity. And the last three historic books are written once they had entered the exile. Then we have five books in the middle of the Old Testament and they are poetic in nature. Judges, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomon. Then we enter the 17 prophetic books. Stay with me, this is a nerd class, but you're gonna like it. In these 17 prophetic books, we have another group where we had Five and 12 made up 17 historic books. And within that, there was five, nine, and three, making a total of 17. In the prophetic books, we also have an initial group of five that are called the major prophets. The remaining 12 are called the minor prophets. Of the 12 minor prophets, it's interesting to note that nine of them were written while Israel was in the promised land. The last three are written after they were taken away into exile. So we've got five, 12, nine and three. Then we've got five, 12, nine and three. Nine in the promised land, three in exile. Nine in the promised land, three in exile. The symmetry is incredible. And then we discover within the major prophets, the major prophets are different because within the major prophets, the first two books were written while Israel was in the promised land. The middle book is called Lamentations, and it's the story of them going into exile, the lament. And the last two, Ezekiel and Daniel, are written once Israel is in exile. We're reading this morning from the book of Ezekiel, the first prophetic book written in the major prophets once Israel had gone into their captivity. Now let's go all the way back to the beginning. In Genesis chapter 12, God called a guy by the name of Abraham. He said, if you will leave your people, your father's land and go to the nation to which I will show you, I will make you into a great nation and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. It is crucial for every Christian to constantly remember that our faith began in a man who had a promise and a dream. If you discover Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, yes, your initial reaction to the holiness of God will be an awareness of your sin. Once your sin is dealt with, it will very quickly be replaced by a lifetime filled with expectation and promise that God has got something greater in store. If you believe that, give me a little amen. As we're entering 2018, don't let it miss you for a second that if you are a Christian, if you are alive, if breath can come in and out of your lungs, that God's promise is still alive in your heart. If you believe that, shout amen. Abraham, Abraham, and then it went to Isaac, then it went to Jacob. Jacob finally got busy, he had the 12 kids. One of them was Joseph, Technicolor Dreamcoat, sold into slavery by his brothers. Joseph went down to Egypt. When Joseph went down to Egypt, he ended up second in charge of that nation. And in a time of famine, the whole family tribe came down to Egypt where they dwelt for the next 400 years. The next 400 years of Israel's history is perplexing because they were God's people with God's promise. And every time they came to worship, God said, I'm gonna take you out. I'm gonna give you a great land. You are my people, I love you, I've called you by name. You are distinct, peculiar, separated to me. You are my chosen people. Yet when they woke in the morning, Egyptian slave masters whipped them, beat them and forced them to work. And for 400 years, they lived with a dichotomy. They lived with this incredible difference between their work experience and their worship experience. And I put it to you that if you're a believer starting 2018 and you feel like the work pressure or the environmental pressure seems to overwhelm and confuse you because you come to God and to His house and you realize God's got more for you, there are greater things ahead, that it is actually the will of God that we live at times with a conundrum, 
where we can't reconcile the fact that our life right now looks difficult, but when we worship, God promises us more. And I want you to know that God will always fulfill His promises. That if you are a believer, never let your expectations of the future be conformed to the realities of your moment. Let your expectation be conformed to the promise of God. God will always bring you out. And eventually God raised up a man by the name of Moses and sure enough, Israel did come out and they were set free. 40 years in the wilderness and then eventually through Joshua's leadership, they entered the promised land. What had been promised to them 440 years previous is now a reality. They have stepped into what they had and may this be the year for many people in this auditorium that you finally get to step into that which you have dreamed for. I want you to know, never let go of your dream. Never compromise your promises. Never lower your expectations. Keep a big faith in God. God is able. And if you believe He's still able in 2018, say amen. amen. They stepped into that promised land and for the next season of time, Israel's life was wonderful, wonderful. I mean, they prospered. It was described as the land flowing with milk and honey. They enjoyed prosperity on every circle. David became their king. Isn't it amazing? Isn't it amazing? that when Moses went to Pharaoh and said, let my people go, Pharaoh's response was to say, make them work harder. Make them work harder so that they will not have the opportunity to listen to the lies being spoken by this man. I want you to know the devil wants to squeeze the promise out of you. Squeeze the worship out of you. If you're getting a flicker of a promise that God could do something greater in your life, don't be surprised if the first thing that happens is things get worse. Never be confused by the fact that when God wants to do something, I'm, pre I'm preaching myself right now, that when God wants to do something great in your life, sometimes it's like the pressure has to get more before you finally burst through into what God has for you. And David, in amazing contrast, to this. They had their work and they had their worship. Pharaoh said, let them be consumed with their work that they may have no time for their worship. And yet David is the worshiper who became the king. And even though he was a worshiper and a warrior, when he became a king, Israel's borders were extended further than under any other period in human history. Prosperity came to the entire land. But with their prosperity came new temptations. And let me remind us all at the beginning of 2018 that we do not worship the things that come our way because of God's blessing. We worship the God who gave us the blessing. It doesn't matter what you have or what you don't have. The most central thing in your life is God, is God and His reality. And Job was right when he said, though he slay me, yet will I praise him. Naked I came, naked I go, went, will go. May the name of the Lord be praised. And in our lives in 2018, never forsake the things, never forsake God because of the things. Keep things external, keep God central. Compromise entered. They began to get involved in all kinds of lewdness, depravity, until finally their, their wandering away from God reached such a point that it harmed their young, their innocent, their vulnerable. And God said, if you don't change, then the land is gonna spit you out. This land belongs to me. Honor me or it will spit you out. Israel refused to listen. So the Babylonian army came down to Israel and literally they put hooks in their noses and like cattle, they led them away to captivity. They sat by a river and a prophet wrote a song by the rivers of Babylon where we lay down. There we wept as we remembered Zion. It's one thing in your life to start your journey with a promise. To be, to be the person that God puts a peculiar sense of His presence within. And you come alive with this thought that you could do more than your surroundings or your family maybe, or that you could break through to another level. It's another thing to live with that, that juxtaposition between your work experience and your worship reality. It's another thing to be someone who's wandering around waiting for the moment that you can step into what you've got. It's, a, it's another stage of life to be in what you've got and to be thankful for it. But I don't think 
in our lives, there is a more difficult position to be in a state of expectation. I, I don't think it's, I don't think there's a season of life harder to be believing God for something greater than the season of life you find yourself in of difficulty and hardship that has come to your life because of your own folly. If you've never been there, you just haven't been alive long enough. When you get to a moment in your life where you realize, I am currently not in a great place and it's my wrong judgment that got me here. When our passage of Scripture is written, I just paint all of that to give you context, that when our passage of Scripture is written, Israel is not at the beginning of its journey. It's not at the middle point of its journey. It's not even in the fulfillment of its journey. It's in a deviation it was never intended by God to go on where its own folly, their own folly has led them to a place that they never thought they would ever be. And the Bible tells us that in that moment, God takes this prophet Ezekiel, who in the middle of hardship still decided to be a worshiper and God lifted him out. And he took him in an amazing place to a valley filled with dry bones, a picture of Israel. They are saying, our hope is gone. Our nation is old and dry. We are over and we are finished. And God took him out to a, a prophetic valley, a place that symbolized the hopes of their nation, old, dry bones, gone, no hope left, everything desolate, the most difficult place for expectation to be found. It's here that we begin our journey because I believe that in 2018, no matter what stage of life you were in, that God wants every single one of us to return to a place where expectation is found within us. What's interesting about this prophet is that he is seeking God. That's where your 2018 is gonna accelerate, my friend. When you and I begin to realize that the smartest thing you can give your time to, your, your attention to, if you could just give your life to seeking a little bit more after God, then you might enter 2018 with just a little bit more uh, possibility for something great to take place. He got there and he saw God. God brought him out and he brought him to a valley. And what's interesting firstly about this valley is the Bible tells us that God, God got Ezekiel to walk all through the valley. Read our passage. It says he, he took him all through the valley. He didn't just take him to the edges of it. When I read that, I thought that's amazing because God had a man walk, a holy man of God, walk amongst the dry bones. And if you've got a problem in your life today, if you've come to the service and there's something really going wrong in your life, I don't think there's a better thing for you to hear than, than God isn't gonna just leave you on the edge of your valley. God isn't gonna just let you look from the edge of the valley and see the dry bones. God will have you walk amongst it. What are you saying, John? I'm saying that if you've come to this building this morning and you're in a financial crisis, don't take your bills and bury them in a cupboard and shut the door hoping that God's gonna deliver you out of it. Walk home from the service and walk amongst your valley of dry bones. Put every bill out on the table and prophesy over them. Get a budget advisor. If you've got a bad doctor's report, don't close your eyes to the doctor's report. Don't neglect the advice. Walk amongst the valley of dry bones. If your children are wayward, if your marriage is in difficulty, go home and talk to your wife, talk to your husband until you understand at least the depth of the problems. Ezekiel was able to sow, these bones are old and they are exceedingly dry. Understand the problem, that's our first point. And then after he understood the depth of the challenges, God said to Abraham, Ezekiel, he said, can these bones live? Can these bones live? As we start 2018, I just think that's a really powerful question for us. To ask ourselves, can your marriage live? Can your business live? Can your children come alive? Is there hope for your tomorrow? Can God outwork that dream? Can God truly do a miracle? Is God able to take us forward? Let us never be found those people who doubt the possibilities of God because we see the problems that we're facing 
as more present or powerful than the God that we worship. Let it be said of us that we are people that are able to get an answer to that question. Can these bones live? Could we go on a little journey, an internal journey for 30 seconds this morning and ask ourselves, can our lives get better? Can situations change? Is God actually able? Is our God mighty? And I believe, friends, that the God that we worship is not small, not impotent. He is not benign. He is not, he is not unable. But the God that we worship is a miracle-working God who can breathe life into dead, dry bones. He can breathe life into desperate situations. He can turn things around. He is a miracle-working God. If you believe it, shout it all, amen. It'll make me feel good. I love it. The Bible tells us that, he, that he, he, he said, can these bones live? And Ezekiel was a smart man. He said, God, you alone know the answer to that question. You alone know the answer to that question. Friends, even if you can't see it, acknowledge that God can do it. Even if your situation turning around is beyond your reach faith-wise, at least try to get yourself to a place where you acknowledge that even though you can't see it, God could do it. Do you believe that a dead person can come back to life? I said, do you believe a dead person can come back to life? If you don't believe that, then why are we believers? We believe that our dead body may die, but our spirit is gonna go to heaven, that the final healing was assured for each and every one of us. If you believe in heaven and a Savior in Jesus, then shout His praise for five seconds. If we believe that, if we believe that, then let's at least acknowledge that what looks impossible for us is possible for God. All things are possible for God. And friends, the Bible tells us that Ezekiel acknowledged that even though he couldn't see it, God could do it. Even though you can't comprehend it, God can do it. Let that be the seed. That would be great. There are 50 people that just need to walk out of the service today going, I can't see it, but God could do it. If you just get that level of faith, I truly believe that could be all you need for a miracle to happen. Wake up for the next week every day and say, God, I can't see it, but that doesn't mean you can't do it. I don't see this marriage turning around, but it doesn't mean you can't do it. I don't see this doctor's report changing, but it doesn't mean you can't do it. You are able, you are able, you are able, you are able. If you believe it, give God a little bit of praise for three seconds, come on. You are able. And then God said to him something so powerful. He said, Ezekiel, speak a prophetic message to these dry bones. I love Ezekiel. Because not only is Ezekiel crazy, but he wrote down the crazy things God told him to do. And here we got a guy speaking a prophetic message to an inanimate object. We got a guy giving a prophetic message to a bone. I mean, it's just a bone. You'd give it to your dog. Ezekiel's giving it the word of the Lord. He's got a congregation of bones. And Ezekiel's out there going, I got a great word for you today. I prayed up, I'm ready to go. Turn with me in your Bibles, bones. And then off he goes. And he speaks a message to his bones. And man, I thought about that, guys, and I thought, I reckon there might be a lot of people in our church that need this year to speak not about your problem. Because we're good, we could spend hours, we're Kiwis, we're New Zealanders, we're, we're human beings, and we know how to talk about our problems. We can define it, we can discuss it, we can give voice to it. Hey, listen, we're smart now, whoa, stupid perhaps, but we can give social media volume to it. Like we know how to, we know how to talk up our problems, we know how to discuss our problems. Well, how about instead of just talking about our problems, how about we decide in 2018 that we're gonna speak a message to our problems? Because we can talk about it, but it ain't gonna do anything to it. But does anybody still believe that when God spoke, the heavens and the earth were created and that that creative God put life and death in the power of our tongue? How about in 2018, we start speaking a message not about our health, but to our health. Why so downcast, oh my soul? Put your hope in God. I will yet praise Him. I'm telling you, there's healing for you. 
there's blessing for you, there's a better tomorrow for you. We serve a God of life and hope and promise and if you believe it, say amen. And I think what a great way it would be for us to start 2018, then just speak into our problems, speak to it, declare it. You will come to life again. There will come muscle on you, skin will cover you, breath will fill you. You might look dead, you might look desperate, you might look beyond redemption, but I'm declaring that there is an army in the valley of dry bones. I'm here to tell you there's promise in your life, there's blessing for your tomorrow. I'm preaching myself excited, making no apologies for it. I really believe that this is gonna be a year where you're gonna see God do something amazing, my friend. But God wants us to lift our expectation for something greater. I have a prayer list. I have a prayer list in my, in my, 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 my reminders on my iPhone that I pray over most mornings, nearly every morning about five in the morning. I pray through my reminders list, but I've added a section to it where I'm just speaking over promises and just declaring those, not just declaring promises for people for healing. We'll talk about that in a minute. But declaring over my life what God is gonna do in this next season of Arise, crazy things. I'm declaring life to a valley. I'm declaring promises from God, open doors, miraculous buildings, campuses to be launched, souls to be saved, a new generation to enter the ministry. I'm declaring God's crazy promises. And I believe that this could be a season where we need to take our words and put them to work. We take our words and we put them to waste. How about we take our words and we put them to work? God said He would take us, hold us to account for every idle word. So how about we start using our words to do something powerful? And I believe in 2018, this is gonna be a year where God's gonna do something amazing, but God's saying to us, speak life, speak life. What's amazing is that as, as Ezekiel began to speak, as Ezekiel began to speak, no sooner had he began to speak those words than the Bible says, at the sound of my words, I heard a rattling. At the sound of my words, I heard a rattling. At the sound of my words, a rattling started in the valley. I love that. That'll preach. I just felt like maybe there's a rattling in the valley. Like maybe if you just begin to speak it, you're gonna hear a rattling in the valley. Like something's gonna come to life. Like there's gonna be a promise for a new tomorrow. Maybe this is a day where we could just let the word of life come alive on the inside of us. In the most impossible situation, there was a supernatural response to the Word of God. And I believe that's gonna be the case for you. About a year ago, I think today, I could be wrong because my memory for dates is not good. I flew down to Christchurch to preach in the Sunday night service. Before I came here, I went to pray for a dear friend who'd been told that she had about six weeks left to live because of a terminal cancer, because six uh, tumors were in her body. I think one in her brain, and then another five down her spine. And the doctor said, you'll probably have about six weeks to live. I got to the house to pray for her and realized the last time I'd been in that house had been about two or three years prior because her sister had died of cancer. I walked into a house that was just mourning. People were mourning. That it was like Jairus' home when Jesus arrived and everybody was singing the dirge. Mother is stroking her daughter's arm, weeping as she's saying goodbye. I walked into the situation and at five o'clock that morning, God had told me, every time you go to the doctor, she goes to the doctor, she's gonna get a better report than what she thought. So I said, in the middle of this crazy situation, I was praying for you, 5 a.m. this morning. This is what God told me. We're gonna pray for you. She's got a Zimmer frame. You know, like one of those walking assistants. She can't walk. She's like lost feeling. It's not, not good. So we, she sits in a chair and we pray for her. After about five minutes of prayer, and I'm believing God for her. I'm speaking life to dry bones. Suddenly, she takes her mother's arm because her mother is stroking her and crying. She grabs her mother's arm. She throws it off. She says, I feel the Holy Spirit. He's in my head. We pray for another 60 seconds. And she says, I feel the Holy Spirit. He's in my back. Another minute or two and she says, I feel the Holy Spirit, he's in my legs. Then the specific mama turns to her husband and says, I have to walk, stand me up. So he, and as a wise guy, stands to his feet <laughs> and helps her to her feet. And to my incredulity, I was the most surprised person in the room, I promise you. She walked backwards and forwards up and down that lounge room 
saying, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus. Then I came to church and I preached. True story. I'm like, that was like so supernatural, I couldn't get my head around it. Tuesday, she goes in for a half hour biopsy. Goes in for the half an hour biopsy. After three hours, her husband calls me. He's crying. She's in there. They're not telling me anything. I don't know what's going on. I said, I'm praying. Four hours, nothing. Five hours, nothing. Six hours, still no word. This guy's distraught. I'm like, I might have to get on a plane and come back. Seven hours later, the doctor comes out. His first three words, I'm, or two words, I'm sorry. He's, he's like, what? Then the doctor says, we have all the scans. We have everything. We know where the tumors are. We can see them. But we opened her up to take a biopsy and we can't find them. We can see where they were. We can see the damage they inflicted, but they're not there. Cancer doesn't disappear, but I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but the cancer is gone from your wife's body. Unbelievable. He called me. He called me five weeks before Christmas. They were in the car. They just got the final surgeon's report. The surgeon said, here are the tumors. This is one we took three weeks ago. They're not there. Cancer doesn't disappear. But in your case, it's gone. And friends, I want you to know that we're not talking at the beginning of 2018 about a God who was I was standing on the front row during worship, realizing that it was approximately, I think it was today, but approximately one year ago that I flew to Christchurch believing for a terminal person to be healed. And I'm here to tell you, it doesn't matter what you're facing in 2018, we serve a God who is worthy of our expectation. We serve a God who is able to give life to desperate situations. We serve a God who is worthy of our worship. And I'm here to tell you, dry bones can live, situations can change, and our God is able. And if you believe it, would you shout amen in this place? Come on, come on. As the band come and join me up on stage, my friends, let me tell you, as we start off into 2018, I truly believe that this is gonna be a year where God does something greater than He's ever done before. This is a year where God's gonna cause a prophetic word to come into your heart, to speak a message to your life, to your situation. Even if your own stupidity got you where you are, we serve a God who doesn't wanna leave you where you are. We serve a God of redemption and a God of promise and a God of second chances. If you believe that, say amen. amen. And then the Bible tells us that this army came together. Why don't you stand your feet with me together this morning? This army came together. Well, I like it. Because as you rise to your feet, so this army stood to its feet. And Ezekiel just recognized something. There's still no breath. There's still no breath. The last thing that I think we need as we start into this year is just His breath. His breath. So He said, Ezekiel, prophesy to the winds and say, come, not winds, come, oh, disciples were in that upper room where Peter's failure had led him believe that he had no tomorrow. The Bible says there came a rushing like a mighty wind and the Holy Spirit fell on him. And as we start in 2018, I just believe God's saying over our lives that the breath is coming breath is coming. And over your life in 2018, I really do believe God's going to do something amazing. You have every reason for expectation. You have every reason for expectation. I tell you all that story to tell you that in their darkest moment, God still had a promise. And no matter what moment you're in, you have a promise. I reckon in this building this morning, we 
we need to just declare the promises of God over your family, over your health, over your destiny, over your future, over your study, over your circumstances. You're going to buy a home this year. You're going to experience God's favour. God's going to open doors, supernatural miracles. You'll see the goodness of God. If you believe our God is able, could you just say a little amen right now? So all over the service, why don't we just close our eyes for just a moment. And if you're here today and you just believe in for something over your life in 2018, we're gonna sing, uh, we speak life, is it? Yeah, in just a moment. But I'd love us to pray for just a minute here today before we do that. Maybe, maybe you're believing for something, a miracle, or maybe you are believing for a destiny, a future. You're praying your life's gonna count for God and for His purpose. Business to turn around, favor. God's wanting to awaken a greater expectation within each and every one of us. And if that's you, man, and any person in this auditorium, why don't you take a hand, take two hands, lift them up in the air, and let's pray for just a moment, a moment this morning. Our God, in the mighty name of Jesus, we ask you, pour out your spirit. Can these bones live? Can these bones live? Speak a message to these bones. Let there be a rattling in the valley. And then we ask, we pray, and we declare, Come, O breath. Come, O breath. To every vision, to every dream, to every broken life, to every, every, every sick body. Come, O breath. Come, O breath. Come, O breath. In the mighty name of Jesus, we declare the healing power of God, the life-giving power of God, the redeeming power of God in this service. In Jesus' mighty name.